I'll be reading from Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Now, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on by the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Stanley? I am thrilled to be with you for a whole host of reasons. It is an serendipitous uh, occasion for me that we are celebrating our newest board member at Mennonite Mission Network. And I'm here this morning to say thank you to you for allowing Beth Jarrett to uh, serve as a board member with the Mennonite Mission Network. We are both uh, honored and excited uh, for all of the experience and mission that uh, Beth will bring, her wisdom, and the counsel that she will provide as we seek to be faithful to our mandate. So thank you for sharing Beth with us. It is our joy to welcome her at the next meeting of the Mission Network Board. I also want to thank you sincerely for the many ways that you have partnered in uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. In the past, you have supported Uh, the Blaus in France, the Stabler Haveners in China, Jackie Wise in the Netherlands, David Hostetler, the Denlingers in Israel, um, who you currently support along with Melanie Quinn in Botswana and Matthew Leonard. So thank you for supporting those people as also some short-term workers like Eunice Hess, uh, who is a participant in the SOUP, Service Opportunities for Older Persons program. And it is an uncanny providence. Last Sunday, I was speaking uh, at the end of a conference in a congregation in South Africa. It happened to be in Peter Maritzburg, the city of my birth, at the uh, Breakthrough International Church. After church, I 
was introduced to two young women. One of them introduced herself as Hannah Souder. And I said, uh, where do you go to church, Hannah? And she said, uh, Neffsville. And I said, really? And she said, yes, that's where I go. I said, well, next Sunday I will be speaking at uh, Neffsville. And so she asked me if I would give to you her personal greetings. I greet you in the name of Hannah, and I uh, share with you that uh, in my conversation with her, she conveyed that she's having a very good experience. Um, and I don't think she said it just because of who I was. I think she, <laughs> she really is having a good experience, and I've uh, shared that with Galen as well. And finally, I'm thrilled to be with you because it gives me the opportunity to thank you in person for the generosity of this congregation toward God's mission. In the fiscal year ending 2010, Nesville contributed $72,152.14. In the fiscal year ending 2011, Nesville contributed $79,955.01. Uh, as you will observe, that's almost a $7,000 improvement at a time when our economy has been challenged, it is a great encouragement and inspiration to us that a congregation like this goes uh, beyond what they have done in the past to um, enable God's mission. And I want to thank each of you personally for the ways that you have contributed uh, to making it possible that God's healing and hope are shed in many places around the world. Let's pause for prayer. God, we are your people, and this is your word. By the gentle persuasion of your spirit, enable a meaningful encounter between we, your people, and this, your word, so that our hearts might be touched, our lives may be transformed, this church made strong, so that the world may believe, and you receive all the glory and the honor and the praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> when I uh, was first a seminary student in South Africa, I had access to about 6,000 theological texts. And then at the end of a pastorate there, my wife and I went to the Salio Colleges in Birmingham to prepare for a uh, stint in mission in Jamaica. At Sally O Colleges in Birmingham, we had access to about 60,000 volumes. At the end of our time in Jamaica, feeling the need for more adequate preparation for mission, uh, we went to Fuller Theological Seminary in, on the West Coast in California and they had access to about 600,000 theological texts. Needless to say, I didn't read all of them. <laughs> but if you think about whether 6,000 or 600,000 texts, it's easy to come away with the notion that this Christian life is a very complicated thing. If it takes 600,000 texts to explain 
uh, what it means to follow Jesus, then it must be really very complicated. But you know that Jesus goes right to the heart of the matter. And Jesus says, really, there are only two things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These two things. These two represent two movements in, in, the Christian, in our Christian life. The first movement renders us objects. While it is a call to love God, it is really a response to the generous love of God that has been revealed through Jesus Christ on our behalf. If there is one thing about the Christian life that we know, what makes it possible is that God in Jesus has loved us. We are the objects of God's extravagant love in Jesus Christ. When you read the biblical text, there are really thousands of stories here. But there is only one single saga. It's the story of a God who so loves you and who so loves me that he is willing to go to extreme measures in order to win us back into relationship with himself. This Bible tells the story of a God whose heart so aches and yearns for being restored in relationship with himself, that there are many interventions that God undertakes and finally sends his own son, Jesus, to be the demonstration of his love for you and for me. And we sort of understand that. Because ever since we were little, we sang the chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And if you were like me, one of the texts that you first learn in Sunday school is, for God so loved the world that he, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is at the heart of the Christian gospel. That's the essence of what of the good news that we proclaim. We are the objects of a gracious, loving God who wants to be in relationship with us. And one of the most important decisions we can make, both in time and for eternity, is that we turn our faces toward God that we engage with God in this relationship in which God seeks to walk with us and to guide us to God's ultimate purpose in eternal life. The second movement is one that uh, we struggle with a little more because that movement renders us subject. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It calls us to become agents or instruments of the love of God to our neighbors, to the world around us. It invites us to be, 
to bridge the love of God uh, into the lives of those that we encounter, of those that God brings across our path. And we maybe because of our modesty, uh, maybe because we um, want to be humble, don't always appreciate that we are the agents of the love of God, the instruments of God's healing and hope in the world, that we are the ones who are called to bridge that love of God that remains abstract for most people unless they experience it through our uh, intervention in their lives. I'll tell you a story that I read recently um, that illustrates this. The founder of the uh, particular sect of the Jewish faith called Hasidic Judaism is called the Baal Shem Tov. And there was a rich man who had everything that he could desire by way of land and properties and uh, cattle and fields. Um, he had everything his heart could desire. But he also had a certain unease he began to wonder whether he had all that he had by sheer dint of hard work. And as he was growing older, he, a desire grew up in him to know whether this was just his hard work and fortune or whether he was blessed of God. And he had heard of a legend that told that Elijah, who was not buried but raptured up into the heavens, wanders the earth. And Elijah brings blessing into the lives of, God's blessing into the lives of people that, uh, to whom God directs him. So this uh, rich man came to the Baal Shem Tov and said, can you tell me where I might find Elijah? Because I would want to know that God has blessed me. And uh, the Baal Shem Tov said, I don't know. And uh, he was disheartened and crestfallen uh, but couldn't uh, make peace with not having this opportunity. So he came back to the Baal Shem Tov, can you please tell me? And he persisted time and time again. Finally, the Baal Shem Tov was wearied by his appearances. And the Baal Shem Tov said to him, I will tell you how you can meet Elijah. This coming Sabbath, I want you to pack your wagon full of rich food and drink and fruit and vegetables, and I want you to make your way to a uh, hut in the middle of the forest, and there you will meet Elijah. And so the rich man loaded his wagon full of wonderful uh, fruit and vegetables and food and drink and waited impatiently for the Sabbath to dawn. And then he made his way through a winding road and came to a humble shack in the forest. When he got there, he knocked on the door and a woman came to open the door. And when the woman opened the door, he noticed that she was wearing tattered clothing, and behind her were two little children who were quite emaciated. And he said, may I join you for the Sabbath? And the woman hesitated, because having a guest would require her to provide hospitality, and all they had to celebrate that Sabbath was bread and water. But from behind her, her husband, you know, husbands don't often care about these things, 
He just said, oh, come on in, join us. And the rich man said, well, I'm happy to join you, but first help me to bring what I have brought inside. So they went out and they brought what he had carried in the wagon in and they cooked up a great feast. And that Sabbath they sang and they prayed and they ate and they danced and they read the Torah. And it was the most wonderful celebration that they had ever had. And the rich man was looking at the father, wondering, could this be Elijah? He noticed, however, that the man picked his teeth and burped loudly. and So he was beginning to have some reservations about whether this could be Elijah. But he didn't want to go by surface appearances. So he said to the man, can you teach me the Torah? And the man said, I'm sorry, I'm illiterate. And the rich man decided this could not be Elijah. And so he, his disappointment grew and he became angrier and angrier as the Sabbath progressed. He had been uh, deceived by the Baal Shem Tov. And his disappointment grew till the time came when the Sabbath ended and he was to leave. And so he bid the family farewell uh, and quite crestfallen left their shack. As he walked out, his uh, boot got stuck in the mud. And he bent down to retrieve his boot he looked through the window as he bent down and he saw the children were dancing and were filled with joy. This was the most wonderful Sabbath they'd ever had. And he saw the wife lean into the husband and the wife said to her husband, who is that who just visited us? And the husband said, why? That was Elijah. That was Elijah. I want to say to each one of us that you and I are called to be the agents, the instruments of God's blessing in a hurting and broken world. When God calls Abraham, God says to Abraham, I will bless you. And I will make you a blessing. In you all of the families of the nations will be blessed. To, it doesn't really matter what your profession is. Whether you're a plumber or a carpenter or a teacher or a doctor or an attorney. Whatever your profession and all of them are good there is really only one calling in each of our lives and that is to be a blessing a blessing that through whom God's healing and hope touches the lives of women and men and children that God brings into our path that is our calling. Whatever you do in all of your encounters, God is inviting you to be a blessing. Many will not know the embrace of God unless you extend your arm of embrace to them. Many will not experience the caring of God unless you extend your hands in compassion and care toward them. Many will not know the words of God unless you allow yourself to speak encouragement 
treatment and healing into their lives. You are called to be a blessing. I'd like to just share with you some contemporary examples. One day I was sitting in my office just about a year ago. A woman on our staff came into the office and she said, uh, Stanley, I would like extraordinary leave. Now we don't generally do extraordinary leave. We have a policy for leave and so I was kind of uh, surprised. And then she went on to explain uh, that one of our colleagues, Chrissy, was uh, diagnosed with a uh, condition where her kidneys were failing, and if she didn't get a transplant, she would certainly die. And Betty decided that she wanted to be an agent of life and blessing in her colleague Chrissy's life. And she said, I want to go get tested for a match, and if I match, I want to give one of my kidneys to, to Chrissy. Now, you know that we, of course, can live with one kidney, but you also know that there are risks involved with this kind of operation. And uh, I, through my lifetime, have had uh, friends who have died on the operating table because of a blood clot or something like that. So it's, it's not without risk. But we granted Betty extraordinary leave, and she, by God's providence, was a match. And uh, today, or this, just this past week, uh, we have an annual, a monthly gathering of all staff. I, I sat in, at lunch and I looked across the table to see Betty and Chrissy sitting there. And it was such a blessing to me to know that within Chrissy is the life of Betty. That Betty understood what it me meant to be a blessing, not just in the external things, but to give of herself to bring life. Another example would be um, Jim Bixler, who is also a colleague. 17 years ago, when Miles Laboratory went out of uh, existence and Bayer, the Bayer Corporation bought the Miles Laboratory in Elkhart, uh, Jim was on staff and uh, took early retirement. Um, but 17 years ago, he came to us and said, I have retired now. He was a young, younger man then. But I'd like to offer myself to bless the work that uh, you are doing in mission. And for the last 17 years, as a volunteer, Jim has showed up every day. Before anyone arrives at the office, he has already made coffee. And whatever task that he is asked to do, he does it and has done it for 17 years. Jim could have sought other employment, he could have traveled the world, he could have done many things, but he chose to be, to be a blessing to God's mission and I showed up every day for the last 17 years without remuneration. A final story. Um, I had the privilege of meeting a young woman, uh, but not in life, I met her in death. Just over a year ago, I was asked to go to Denver, uh, Colorado, to participate in the funeral of a young woman. The young woman's name was Chloe Weaver. When I arrived, I was expecting that there'd be 200 people, but there were probably about 600 people at the funeral. I was handed a bulletin, and in the bulletin was a bookmark. On the bookmark was a picture of Chloe, and then beneath the picture, an obviously elementary sketch of the world. 
And beneath the world, these words, the world is my community. Somewhere in her elementary school years, Chloe heard that phrase. She went home and drew a sketch of the world and wrote this underneath and pinned it on her bedroom door. Later, when she went to Heston College, she took that same sketch and put it on the door of her uh, dorm. And then when she came to serve in Alamosa, Colorado, she brought the same sketch to the unit house in, in Alamosa. Chloe served with young children at a place called La Puente. Most of these children were from immigrant families, a lot of them in situations of great poverty and struggle. Many of these kids uh, didn't receive much love, um, but Chloe took it upon herself to pour out her life into the li life of these children. And so she did. She extended compassion and care to them and helped them to know that they were of great value and loved by God and by, by Chloe. But one afternoon, a Sunday afternoon after church, Chloe went for a bike ride. And as she was out riding, a 16-year-old drove directly into her and killed her instantly. At the service, there were many testimonies of this young woman's life, how she touched people by the generosity of her spirit and compassion. At the end of this service, as we walked to the fellowship hall, on the walls in the hallway, there were tableaus. And in each of these were uh, little imprint, imprints of little hands, the hands of the children Chloe served at La Puente. And inside each little hand were expressions of love and appreciation for the love that Chloe had showed to them. Chloe understood what it meant to be an agent of God's love and compassion, an instrument of God's healing and hope in the lives of others. She lived a short life, died at 21, but she touched many, many lives. Many of those children will look back to the time she was at La Puente and remember that perhaps for the first time they understood what it meant to be loved by God. All around the world, because of your sharing, mission workers are attempting as the Spirit gives them uh, equipping, are attempting to share this love of God, to bridge God's healing and hope to people in the communities in which they serve. Thank you. Thank you for making that possible. But I also want to invite you to consider how you may be an agent, an instrument, of God's healing and hope in your routine, the people that God brings across your way, would you be willing to say how you're doing and not just keep on walking, but really listen so that you hear and can speak the words of God's healing and hope into the lives of those you encounter? Would you be willing just to put your arm around somebody who's hurting, who's lonely, who's discouraged, and bring, speak encouragement into their lives? Would you be willing to share the compassion of God with those around you? Because whatever else you do in this life, your single primary calling is to be an agent of God's blessing. That is what our mission is all about. God calls us across the street in this community, but all around the world to be 
instruments of God's healing and hope. And so God calls us by the power of the Holy Spirit to grow as a community of grace, joy, and peace so that God's healing and hope flow through us to the world. That is the end for which we are here today so that we might be captivated again by that vision and empowered by the Spirit to go from this place to all the places where God deploys us as a congregation to be a blessing and a Elijah to those who seek to know the blessing of God.